Welcome to my talk, uh, which is the, sadly the, the last one of this uh, beautiful conference, and thanks for having me. Um, so the quick poll is always in the beginning, like, uh, who's using Vagrant? Okay, the half. Who's using Vagrant on OpenBSD? <laughs> <laughs> You did a sneak preview. No, 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 <laughs> yeah, guest guest support in Vagrant is uh, available since uh, for some years now. But um, so for the for the other half, uh, Vagrant is a tool to abstract virtualization. So if you ever had tried to uh, recreate a virtual box setting uh, just by clicking through the GUI. Um, you are creating 10 VMs and you have 10 snowflakes because you end up in documentation of something like 20 screenshots and then the GUI is changing again and the next time you're recreating the VM uh, it will be slightly different and whatever happens. And Wagon is taking that burden away and also it can talk to um, so-called providers and so you can use the same Wagon configuration with different uh, providers. Uh, so far that's um, built in VirtualBox, Hyper-V and Docker and there are extensions to have it with VMware or whatever else. So what, are, what am I trying to solve? Oops, hello. It did work five minutes ago. <laughs> Whiplash and horror, how we use whatever. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the effort was uh, to bring. Um, integrate the uh, OpenBSD's uh, VMM framework, uh, notably the VMD, uh, into Vagrant, so we can use um, Vagrant on OpenBSD like uh, it was possible so far on OS X or Linux, and run a lot of Puffy instances uh, on your machine with uh, not that much hassle to create a VM conf and all the bridge setup and PF conf and here and there and that, it's not that easy. And so you can take away, I will show that in more detail, uh, you can take away your um, auto-install testing uh, just on a plane, your train ride, your daily commute, or just to the kitchen, whatever. And um, with the Vagrant uh, provisioning, um, you can just re recreate absolutely identical VMs. Um, and with the auto install features from OpenBSD added, um, this could be also reproducible snowflakes. And that's very nice. And as I said, uh, later on you can run the same configuration uh, on Linux, OpenBSD, OS X, maybe in the cloud or on Windows, whatever happens. So the idea is you have that's representing uh, a little HP microserver running OpenBSD, sure enough. And um, Wakerun can now uh, launch me um, a bootstrap VM where I have all the um, install packages I need. And then I just uh, run up um, another VM instance and I can install that from the bootstrap VM, the second one. Um, would be just a relay, like if you're on a data center, you want to minimize uh, your broadcast uh, blast radius, and you can do that then with DHC relay. And I said, I can just put that same configuration on this OS X laptop, hop on the plane to Canada, uh, Canada and just continue testing. And because virtualization is just one, one big hype, but um, what we are actually doing is we're 
testing it virtualized, but we are putting it in, into production on real machines. So later on, if you are, which one is the laser pointer? This one. If you are replicating this setup up here, you can just take away the laptop and then work on with uh, your auto install setup over here. Anyone thinks I'm crazy about this? <laughs> no. Might be useful. Okay, uh, the project isn't ready for prime time yet. I'm sorry. Always stuff uh, coming in between. But uh, the really grunty uh, groundwork is done and it's only adding some more lines of code. <laughs> And um, I can, sir. Just a bit of time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Just prioritization uh, is a thing. So um, the the next thing that's needed is um, to have um, a C BIOS that is pixel booting. That's not published yet. Mike had uh, given me that some weeks ago. So you can actually do auto install over um, Pixie Boot. The Vagrant Core itself um, is just a heck of a Ruby code uh, tree, and that's just running um, without any additional porting effort or something. But uh, integrating um, the VMD, um, so Vagrant is uh, capable of using it. That was a development effort. Um, and also to really leverage auto install, um, you have to dig through that because the documentation says, okay, there is auto install features and this is how it is roughly working, but any concepts of um, distributed installations or something else isn't just there. So you have to make that up. And I haven't seen any talk about it, so here it is. So we have one half of the talk is about how I did um, bring Vagrant on OpenBSD in the second half, maybe a bit longer than a half, is about uh, how to leverage auto install. And who is a porter on OpenBSD? <laughs> one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I think I actually maintain one port. Oh, in Ruby? No. Well, the thing is uh, the, the, the port infrastructure has a very good support. If you have a, just a gem on Ruby gems, then you can just say make um, template is uh, it's a gem, and it will download and make a port out of it, and that's very easy. But um, Vagrant itself is a bit more a difficult thing, and I'm just not so that deep in port, so if there's someone popping up helping me with that, that would be greatly appreciated. <coughs> Oops. So like I said, um, there's already that thing that Vagrant uh, is aware of. It's running on OpenBSD, so it should use um, the, the VMD as a provider. And it can do the whole VM lifecycle. That's importing um, a base image called a box in Vagrant speak. It can uh, fire it up, um, let VMD configure the, the IP addresses on, on the outer and the inner side, or say the host and the guest side, and then SSH into it to have some basic uh, configuring. And you can hold and destroy the, the image uh, afterwards if you like to. And also I was uh, going through all of uh, auto install and over time, that's a bit longer ongoing already, how to use some not so well known features from auto install to have um, very customized installations. So Vagrant itself is just if you're looking at it at the core, it's more or less bringing itself up and then splitting any, mostly anything else into so-called plugins. How those are laid out, that's on a 
probably next next slide, and some utility helpers about. Um, um, so you have some Ruby primitives for handling IP addresses or whatever. And the machine it's running on is called the host, and it has certain capabilities you have to uh, implement, like, for example, being uh, an NFS server for uh, the synch folder synchronization with the, with the guest if you need that. Then the so-called box, that's um, a disk or a BIOS image, whatever is bootable with your provider. And some metadata. Um, and the box format, it is called dot .box as a file name. But if, uh, in the end, it's just a touchy set. Same goes for the guest, um, which is the running or to be run VM. And its capabilities, how it could mount a remote NFS server or something like that. The provider is the actual hypervisor you are using, and that's the main thing we are we're talking about today in this uh, talk. The communicators um, are so that Vagrant, after the VM has come up, uh, can log into the machine and uh, do something like setting the host name or do, do whatever you need to like provision us. So when the machine is fully up, the VM machine, um, you can add additional provisioning and that can be, could be an inline shell script or external sh uh, shell script, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Salt, almost everything out there in the today's world um, is reachable via uh, an additional plugin if you need it. So when the plugins are loaded with so-called lazy loading, that's all uh, Ruby classes. And if you want to extend existing plugins or stuff uh, from the utility folder from, from Reagan core itself, you can just do that and it will overload those classes with your additional stuff. So typical OO pro programming uh, parts. Um, the so-called action um, part is where you define just the workflow of functions you want to have for example, you're bringing the machine up, you're bringing it down, uh, you are importing it, and that's just an abstract action. you just um, saying, okay, you're doing this and that, and Vagrant will call depending on what, you, uh, on what command you have uh, provided at the command line. <clears throat> and from those uh, action framework, you're calling directly in the so-called driver, which is the uh, functional part where you interact with, uh, for example, VMCTL or the VBox manager and so on. So everything you need that uh, Vagrant should touch on, you have an abstracted action and then a driver where you more or less make a uh, system shell call, whatever, and then say VMCTL load in your configuration file. And to have a vm.conf um, that can be um, used for that, there's a template eng engine that's just the typical ERB stuff from, from Ruby. Vagrant provides or has the concept of networking capabilities, and you have to implement all of them um, if you would want to uh, have them used. So there's port forwarding, so you can say, uh, please open the port 8080 on, on your host machine, a local host, mm -hmm. and it should connect internally over an SSH port forward to your uh, Nginx instance within the VM on port 80. So you can, on the laptop, open your browser on local 8080 and it will be served from the engine X within the VM. Bridge network is the other way around, but just flat, so it's not port forwarding. It's only that um, the VM can reach out up to the host, and then it depends on the host setup uh, if it's going further. For one thing, is the host forwarding, and maybe there is a need for, um, if you're using IPv4, you have to NAT. 
and private networks um, where I'm still thinking about actually implementation to have it really isolated, like isolated on a paranoia level and not just so, is uh, private networks where you can say, okay, you're shooting up two VMs or five or whatever you need to, and you say VM one and two should uh, be able to interact over virtualized Ethernet connection and three, four, and five as well, but one, those two groups are um, not able to reach each other. Provisionals, like I said, it's more or less uh, for reference. Um, the easiest thing is what I'm typically using is to, after the machine has come up, I'm deleting the default route and set up the routing um, in line just, just later. Also, you can then run, um, if you need to, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Salt. I don't know, is there even more hyped provisional nowadays? I think it's, it's covering it all. And then you can just do additional uh, automation and orchestration of your uh, VM setup. So the path integration, you need that the VM can talk to the outside world. Um, given the default setup, um, VMD is using, um, you need that one that this network that's used by default from VMD to assign addresses on the outside tab interface and the VIO within uh, the VM guest. So you have to net to that to your um, laptop external interface or if it's a server, then that one. And the next thing is that's a bit questionable. Um, VMD will just send out DHCP answer packets about the name server, um, saying the name server is the IP address of that tab interface from the host, and that's uh, and two times. So that's pretty useless on the one, uh, one part. And also, by default, you won't have a DNS server um, just there, uh, because the tab interface is created on the fly. So if you are running unbound, it binds to everything possible, but since that tab interface isn't there yet, it cannot bind it. So you need something like that. Or you redirect it to your beloved internal DNS server, wherever it is. And don't forget about forwarding, because otherwise not to won't work. Click. So to have this a uh, bit upside down, this is the is a minimum vagrant file. Not even minimum, there's already a, a little bit of addition here. Uh, by default, uh, vagrant is using sudo, but we have removed that crap. So we have to tell it, please use that command. And uh, percent %c is just a, a placeholder for the command you are uh, trying to run. And if you say, ah, oh, First thing is, okay, we are running on an OpenBSD machine. Um, that's just a little HP microserver in Hamburg. And then we are bringing it up. And then use this bundle exec because I have not yet a full binary port of, of Vagrant. And that's a Ruby thing that you can run Ruby source without bin stops uh, just from the working directory you have your sources checked out. So it bring in, it, it's looking for the status, and it says, this is the provider, this is the host name, and it's not created yet. That means uh, you have a definition, you want such a box, um, but it has uh, never been started before, so it is instancing it. And it's doing that by uh, taking that box file and more or less untowering it and copying it to a uh, more or less hidden working directory and uh, then tells uh, VM VMCTL load with a generated config file to bring that up and after a while you're seeing that the tap device um, is on 2.2 and the VM 
uh, IP address is typically when if it's the first run on on here, uh, 2.3, and then it's logging in with SSH into the VM, and that's a very great feature that it will create a private public SSH key pair on the fly, and will insert that for um, the root user in this case. You can define which user is uh, being used for login. Yeah, and then the machine is booted up and ready, and look, we have Puffy and Puffy. Great, thanks. 420. So that's it for the Vagrant part. I cannot go into details how Vagrant works or different Vagrant configurations. If you have been using Vagrant, you surely know how to, uh, how to um, port it to uh, what you need on OpenBSD itself. So how soon before you end up with this actually in port? So? When you get, how soon before we have a working I have no idea. Um, what, what was the name of the um, Ruby doing everything? Jeremy? Yeah, I don't remember. Something along that and um, <clears throat> I might... You need the Ruby features. Yeah, I need something that is doing a port out of Ruby software which is not really a gem. Yeah. Because gems is easy. I did that with a, with a demo or Proof of concept plugin, but Wagon itself is a bit beasty. Yeah. So, cannot tell. Uh, while that is uh, in the works, <laughs> um, I will add more features to the provider, uh, especially the VM to VM okay. networking. Any other question? Wow, everybody stunned. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, so, off to auto install. Who is using auto install? Wow. Who's using OpenBSD in here? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, so, everybody has seen the, the installer, which is just um, an easy thing to use, even if you're doing it by hand. But if you are running up like 50 or 100 machines, um, it's a bit tedious to do that uh, by hand. So I think, when was it added? 5.8 or 5.7 or something? Yeah. Um, the, the installer itself, not only the auto installer, it's just the installer can be started in, in different modes. Yeah? Oh, wow. Getting already old. <clears throat> so uh, the, the installer is uh, two shell scripts um, being merged into one, and that's just um, the, the greatest part of it is um, shared shell script between all architectures. And then you have machine dependent um, functions, especially in the uh, area of disk setup, since. Uh, Handling a, a PC disk and one on a Spark is just very different, and so that's split it. And at least for AMD 64, um, if the, the merged insert shell script is three and a half hours and lines, and I have read it all. And it's advanced shell scripting, it's by far nothing spaghetti or so. Um, dare you to look into it, but don't be scared. Um, it can do an installation or an upgrade, but I'm completely focused on installation since we are with all those uh, features more or less in the thing that if it breaks, throw it away and restart. Um, the auto installer, if it started that way or just detecting it, um, gets a so called answer file, and that's either in the RAM disk image you are booting up, or it might get downloaded. I'm coming to that detail later on. And this answer file consists easily out of the string you are seeing if you are doing an interactive install, and you are just adding the answers you would type in, or just enter for the defaults um, when you are doing manually. 
And if you are doing maybe the, some advanced setups where you might be installing the base operating system from CD or an official mirror and then additional packages from somewhere else, you are just repeating those questions oh, and the answers, of course. And it's using HTTPS by default and the Signify tool to check the integrity of, uh, of the packages before it's uh, getting actually installed. And if it's running through that in all glory detail, um, the RAM disk will come up, fire up in it, at the RC, uh, launching a corn shell, reading dot profile, and then it detects, uh, have I been net booted by Pixie? And if that's the case, uh, um, after five seconds, it will enter um, the auto install mode. Uh, it configures the network again, like it's reissuing a DHCP request. And uh, it will look out to, um, is that FTP open BST org, that IP address with the FTP list CGI Bob? I think so. Um, where it gets a mirror list. I don't know why, it's, why it, that's in order. So I don't know why that's coming first, but anyway. <laughs> it will fetch the answer file. How it's choosing that, this, that's another page. It will set up the disk, uh, then fetch the uh, base 6.3 touch set and so on. Uh, doing the system configuration, like uh, time soon and the user setup and so. Um, I'm unsure if that's correct in order, but it will relink the kernel for the uh, KRL uh, feature and uh, installing all the boot blocks and what post in, custom post install can be um, is in a detailed page later on as well. And it will fill uh, at the RC first time. So when the machine is coming up, uh, everything that's in there, and that's typically it nowadays syspatch and sysmerge. And the firewall, uh, firmware updates, and then uh, it will unlink this file by itself. Questions? Do you know all this? So we can have beer early, or? <laughs> well, I, I do, and I might jump ahead to what you're, you're doing with the question. Um, when you fetch the official mirror list, and fetch the answer file. Um, Are you, you fetching 100 answer lists and fetching 100 answer files, or are you clone, 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 clone uh, the VM from the same inputs every time? No cloning, so it's always from a fresh. It always just, it always just, so all of the VMs boot and just run the standard install process. If you want to. What you also can do, and that's what I'm doing for the, for the basic lifecycle testing, is you do it, for example, manually once, and then you hold, it's, uh, I have that in the, um, in the GitHub repo, there is a, uh, a build.md file, and there's outline what you have to do, and you halt, after the install is finished, you, you're not rebooting, but halting it, so it won't run first time yeah. for that very image. <coughs> And then you box it and tell Vagrant, please, um, well, store this box in your global yeah. hidden directory. And when you are uh, doing exactly this one, it will fetch the box, clone it at that moment here. Yeah, yeah. And then putting the disk IMG over there in a directory that is like a dot vagrant machines, uh, oops. in this case, uh, vagro beastie. There you will find the metadata, the, the disk image itself, and in this case, uh, also the vm.conf, and then it will fire up that one. I, I want to look at this with you later and make sure we're doing the right thing with the initial random data. 
That's why I said halt the machine yeah, <laughs> and do not reboot. But it's not only random seed, yeah. but also if you would do a reboot, all of your clones would have the same SSHD host key. Yeah, which we don't want. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. Well, I'm... You knew where it was going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I have done a lot of reboots. Yeah. I'm coming to that later on. Um, this will be an option later um, when the software is uh, going going to be better. Right now, I'm starting it with um, the built-in DHCP server, and that one has no options, so that's a bit bad. Uh, but you can. I'm talking about like the DHCP option where you can put in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Flag. Coming. Uh, the problem is that. The VMD built-in has no idea of that, and uh, so you have um, to um, get rid of that. The the thing would be, you have your host, you fire up um, an install server having um, a full capable TFTP and DHCP server, and the second VM uh, will come up with only Pixie BIOS and talking to that installer VM. And then the trick here, uh, the tricks you can do there, I'm coming to that later. Because you don't want to have that within Vagrant, because if you're removing the Vagrant environment after your testing had, had been done, um, you would really change the infrastructure, and then your testing is more or less useless. So for um, the, the, this configuration, which was always uh, a rather clumsy part in the early days of auto install, it was just like uh, this um, calculated layout or die. And I think two years ago or so, there was an uh, added option that you can download um, a disk label template. Uh, to have uh, your own um, slices, mount points, and sizing, and all that detail about that coming into configuration reference. And Peter is you know, probably looking for IPv6 boot up. Um, the audience sort of for now cannot do um, soft rate, neither mirror or any crypto setup or so. Um, the quirk I'm using is I'm installing twice with a custom post install. So I'm installing on the first disk and the post install will run um, just calling BioCTL to set up a mirror. And then I'm rebooting and using an answer file which says SD0. Well, I, depending on what, uh, when you have uh, AHCI, SD2, and then do the real install. That's the fun thing with automation. <laughs> Network support, uh, DHCP for INET 4 or uh, AAC uh, for INET 6, which is two rooms uh, for on how that is working. Uh, you can do static configuration, but actually I'm not really a fan of it, but there is uh, a bit of a thing in the current installer I'm not really liking, and I'm talking about that in a minute. Uh, you can have um, an HTTP or HTTPS proxy uh, to be used, and there's that FTP list CGI that's uh, for, um, you can choose a mirror, and it will also do some trickery uh, to, to find your nearest or fastest mirror and um, storing that. No? <laughs> well, it, it actually stores it on the master mirror. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 phone, it, right no, <laughs> it phones home. <laughs> it does phone. 
<laughs> but it, it actually does. There's one other function of FTP list. Yeah, was, there might be kids watching. <laughs> so leave that. Um, debugging. Um, if you are trying hard, uh, you are failing hard as well. And if anything bad happens, the typical thing would be you have a new release. It's adding a new question. So the answer file cannot question it, and then the installer will just drop to interactive, or if it's really going uh, bad down, uh, it drops to the current run disk shell. And you can look for stuff in uh, temp AI, where you have a log file of, us, of what happened since the boot, and you also get the AI.conf, um, which is a good thing, because I had the problem that <laughs> Rogue DHCP more or less, self-made rogue, and I got an answer file from a different machine. So you can just put a comment on top of your answer file like, I'm coming from here. So you know that it had been fetching from, from the wrong server, so there's something fishy. Um, all the locked or more, more or less used answers are in that file and dollar mode is either install or update. That's uh, about uh, um, used mirrors and or available and this one was about um, forgot. Do you know? That one is the CGI info is about yeah. All about uh, remote network resources and those two files, uh, yeah. which is what, yeah. whatever. And then you can do, if it's just a missing an answer, uh, you don't necessarily have to start over completely. You can fix this AI.conf if you can do add <laughs> or whatever else. CGI info is the collection of name value pairs fed of the from FTP list on CGI. Yeah, right. The and then you and, can. And those name value in pairs include some interesting keys, like yeah. NSA key pair, CSIS key pair, which <laughs> right. are inscrutable, inscrutable values. Yeah, so more or less like checksums of which mirror is it. Uh, so uh, which mirror you took, yeah. which, which architecture you took, what options you took. And that's, yeah. that's then used later on in the install for doing things like yeah. saving where, where your port stuff is at. And the, the, the weird values that look like spy values that look like they're full of random data, well, they're just full of random data. And that's because you get to eat our core random <laughs> off of the server as an initial way to add entropy to every open BST install. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you, you, you're changing the config file just for, for kicks if you well, just want to try some. Don't those keys predate the random injection to boot? Yeah. That's a different thing. They were always used for that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the the installer, if if you're booting it um, and um, well manually or at the console, you it's asking you about auto install shell installer upgrade, and that's just like uh, you can. Also started from the command line install, so please make an auto install and use that configuration file and you just pull that from everywhere um, you have access to and want to. Uh, that's for debugging. I was surprised it's so much like if you're using kickstart, it will just fa fail over and you have some blast radius lying there and that's about it. <laughs> So that's configuration reference. I won't go into uh, detail of all of it. I mean, most of the stuff is uh, self-explanatory, and you have likely seen that uh, on the manual installations anyway. Um, the only thing, if you are doing that uh, for the Vagrant-based images, you should really start SSHD. It will be pretty pointless if not. Um, and 
don't start X window. That's not going to be very useless for the next years. <laughs> um, a nice trickery is with the, the set names um, that you can do some uh, basic uh, expression uh, matching. And I could do like, I'm using um, HTTPS and i um, using also an official mirror. And in the answer file, I will repeat that answer because after the first sets have been installed, it will ask you again for location of sets. And you, usually the default is done and everybody's hitting that. But you can just say again, HTTP uh, or HTTPS, uh, installing and then it will ask for the next server and then you can advance to your local install server hosting uh, for example uh, site towers and what site towers is coming to that. Um, as I said previously you can do um, an auto layout for the root disk for all the other disks uh, that's not supported for now so maybe you are, for the part of the auto install, maybe you're only configuring um, the, um, the root disk and then using more or less the same concept in a post install. Um, if you are using, uh, setting up a user, which you probably should, root logins are just one thing. Um, do not set a, a password, and you have to use uh, 13 times an asterisk here, and then you can just add a new user and a key for that and a, a key for the actually root account. I mean, that's a shorted key, obviously. And prohibit uh, password logins, so that's more or less the same result. Um, Is it possible to set like a here? Yeah. Yeah, but do not have a root password. Okay. <laughs> Out. <laughs> Make that uh, key based. Uh, the early example of that Vagrant obsession was using password authentication um, because I was too lazy to use uh, the default Vagrant insecure key to put it into the image already. So, But usually the boxes should be built like that. Uh, Vagrant ships an SSH key pair and it's calling it insecure. So you install it um, into the initial image for the root account or a Vagrant account. And on the first startup it will detect, oh that's my key, because I, I can log in actually. And then it will um, make a new key on the fly and insert that uh, into authorized keys. Which is remembering from the talk from, from Michael Lucas, I don't know right now if it's uh, sophisticated enough to look into the actual SSHD config. For sure it's doing it in .SSH authorized keys, but if you are having it elsewhere, I'm unsure. Might happen, uh, there's a lot of uh, clever trickery in Vagrant. I'm seven minutes behind, but anyway. Um, the installer is actually checking your clock. So when it talks uh, to the mirror or to FTP list CGI, it will look for uh, the HTTPS timestamping. And if your clock is way too off, um, this question will pop up. And that's one of the questions that caught me offside just after maybe a hundred tries, doing perfectly normal. And then you're getting a machine which was maybe refurbished and bat battery of the internal clock died and suddenly auto install is not returning. Like, must be ready already and then hooking up the console and it was sitting exactly there. So uh, you might want to have that as a default. Um, yeah, and I said you can have a proxy and 
Um, the, if I'm giving it just an IP, it will default to HTTPS since a year or so. And then you're just giving the, the server directory. I mean, you've likely uh, seen that. If you're using your own um, uh, sets server, and it's not using H and it's not reachable by HTTPS. Uh, there's still a fallback possible. So if you really want that, you should set that to yes. Runtime networking, um, especially with this um, um, very basic DHCP server in VMD, this one is a bit tricky. Since it detects, I got all the information about uh, DNS from my DHCP server, so I'm not even asking. And not asking means it's not reading the answers. So after installation, you still have uh, 100.64.2.2 in your resolve conf, and that's not really funny. That should be changed the other day, I think so. Um, that's more or less self-explanatory. Uh, for, for two or three releases, you can do, use uh, SIDA addressing. Um, yeah, and wireless setup in a VM. I'm not using that, but it's here for reference. And now for really grievance. Um, if you are using additional packages, or not packages in, in terms of uh, package and ports, but sets. Um, you will run into this, and for now there is no solution because we we customize us. We don't have the official OpenBSD signify key, most obviously. So we can assign the packages correctly, and the installer will always uh, complain about that. And so you need these two options in your answer file for every additional set you are uh, adding. So you have to repeat that if you have two or three or whatever, how many sets are. Um, too bad, but I don't see a solution to that. So <clears throat> a side package, um, you can just put in there whatever you want. It's a Tarshi Z file, and it will be just unpacked as this, where slash mount is the future root file system. And within this, um, you can add a file install.site, which can be any script. I'm using typically conchal, but you could use Perl or whatever you like, given it's already installed, the interpreter. And this is really recurring for me. Um, the installer is executing this file. So please set an execute bit. Otherwise, nothing will happen, and it will not even complain about it. <laughs> Just silently doing nothing. Say debug. Ah. No, 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 not SH, but yeah. SH. He's saying make sure you chmod the site installed on change mod. Install the site. Yeah. I think if I left dash x on the invocation, it'd be a little surprising, but it still doesn't work. <laughs> well, anyway, when you're, you're maybe creating just a file uh, out of a template, and by default, it won't have an execute bit, and then you tar it up, and the installer tries to execute it, it internally, it internally permission, and it's not failing at that moment. That's the, fun, fun, uh, the funky thing. And uh, it's... Um, executed uh, in a change root for slash uh, mnt and that's mounted for the future root file system. We should actually, because I know it doesn't fail, because I remember this, we should ask for Robert for some kind of patch, because I believe what it's doing is it checks for install.site by basically using shell. Yeah. 
shell minus x. You do a minus x test. Yeah. And so it just says, oh, it's not there. Oh, just exact, do exactly. I just don't do it. I failed yeah. violently. Exactly. If it's not executable, it should, it should really, ignore. We should really change that. Yeah. Be if minus r. <laughs> Go ahead. And it's not minus x to actually batch. Yeah. So that you see it. So the, the installer can, can look for additional packages uh, like uh, site and NN is for the release number as like for uh, base 6.3 teaches that and also for host name. Um, so if you are installing in different data centers, um, you need some special configurations you do not want to do with Ansible or whatever or you need uh, very special binaries you cannot get there. By other means, uh, you can have that side, and then every uh, host in, uh, in there can even get a more specialized uh, touchy set file. So that's the part where you can go mad about snowflaking the machines. So um, the part only two slides, so a bit over time, but sorry. Um, that's actually a talk for one and a half hours or something. Um, you have been asking about it. So um, when a machine boots uh, via Pixie and um, you have to have your TFTP, uh, DHCP server, that it will return a file name and based on what you are returning, um, the installer will go in mode installing or upgrading up here. And then it will try to fetch that file. And typically, you want to, ha uh, want to have a, a BSD RD image uh, coming from there. Uh, so just do a symlink for the stupid TFTP servers. And there's a new feature uh, since 6.3 that the TFTP server uh, can serve a per IP address. So you have uh, slash TFTP boot and then 10.1.1.2 uh, uh, slash BSD RD. And for another one, a different kernel. So more customization and snowflaking there. You can return next server where it will download its answer file and it will first try to download an answer file, uh, MAC address minus install or upgrade, uh, update, and then hostname dash install.conf or just basically install.conf. And symlinking works as well here. And then you have the decision uh, which HTTP server or servers, as already shown, you are getting from. And if you are adding DHC, D, DHC relay into that, you can make it pretty complex. Uh, there are some more now nowadays. I was checking the latest man page, so uh, see the other install man page. It's uh, listed at the top. Um, you can do a bit more in here. So um, since this is still work in progress, I'm sorry. But um, this should be at a really good state until September in Bucharest for the EuroBSDCon, where likely, where's Christoph? Everybody missing. Uh, submitting um, uh, a tutorial how to really exploit this or leverage it. Um, if you want to help, be my guest, especially with the thing about porting, making a port out of this Ruby mess. And yeah, it all started uh, at a mini hackathon in Switzerland, which was very nicely hosted. So questions, we have four minutes officially. Uh, slides are here, or you can just QR scan this. <laughs> 